crystal graph. Actually, there are two graphs here. The one on the left shows you from the period 1958 to 2011, the percentage of Canadian citizens who were eligible to vote, who actually did vote. And you will notice that the graph slopes downward. In other words, whereas in 1958, something like 80% of Canadians who were eligible to vote did vote in the federal election of that year, the percentage was more like 56-57% by the time of the last election held in 2011. And if you merely extrapolate, that is to say, continue the trend in the data that is evident from 1958 to 2000. And 11, then by 2041, fewer than half of Canadian citizens will be voting in federal elections. Of course, it's often dangerous to simply extrapolate tendencies, but this one is pretty strong. It seems clear that a declining percentage of Canadians give a damn about politics. They don't vote. And in fact, you may see this kind of attitude reflected in your own mind. You may lack much interest in formal electoral politics. And the graph on the right suggests that, in fact, a considerable proportion of you do lack fascination with the world of electoral politics. What this shows you, the graph on the right, is turnout in the 2011 federal election. It shows you the percentage of people in each age cohort in Canada who voted. And you will notice that although there is a decline for those over the age of 74, at the far right of the graph there's a drop. And the reason is that many people over 74 will find it difficult to get out and vote on election day because they may be infirm in one way or another or ill. The main tendency of this graph is upwards, which means that the people who are least likely to vote are those in the 18 to 24 age group, which is the age group of most of you. And next is the 25 to 34 age group, and so on and so forth, until we get to the 65 to 74 age group. In other words, if it is the case that a declining percentage of Canadians are interested in electoral politics, it is especially the case that that is true of young people. Young people are turned off in large numbers. Not everyone, of course, but many. That's, so that's one worrisome trend about politics in Canada today. And in fact, this trend is evident in all Western liberal democracies. Canada is not unusual. Here's a second interesting and perhaps troubling trend. I'll say it twice because it's a bit of a mouthful. There are persistent wealth-based inequalities, persistent wealth-based inequalities in political participation and in political influence. That is to say, people who are wealthier tend to participate in politics more than people who are not well-to-do and they tend to have a lot more influence. And in fact, that's part of the reason why so many Canadians are turned off of electoral politics, because they feel that they have little influence. They don't bother participating because they say, what does it matter if I participate? The same thing is going to go on because the system is gained, it's controlled by the wealthiest. And you can see the evidence for the persistence of wealth-based inequalities in political participation and political influence in a number of different indicators. Here's one of them. This shows you who's contributing to Canadian political parties in a given year. Who's making monetary contributions? Why is it important to look at who's making monetary contributions? I'm certainly not in a position to say that people by influence, but nonetheless, people who make contributions do expect that political figures who they support through dollars and cents will at least be sympathetic 
to the kinds of policies favored by those making the contributions. And if you look at Canada as a whole, or any of the major regions of Canada, you find the same pattern. The people who contribute most to political parties are those who earn the most. And those who contribute least are those who earn the least. Not only that, but we have studies, survey-based studies, which try to find out who writes to their members of parliament or email to their members of parliament. Who runs for political office? Who, uh, in other words, is active in political affairs in ways other than making uh, financial contributions? And we find the same pattern. The people who are most likely to vote, the people who are most likely to contribute, the people who are most likely to get in touch with their members of parliament by email, by phone, by, uh, by writing them letters, tend to be the wealthier people rather than the less wealthy. And it's also interesting to note in this regard, on this theme, of their existing, these persistent wealth-based inequalities, political participation, and political influence, that if you look at people who actually hold the highest political offices in the land, the prime ministers, the members of the federal cabinet, the provincial premiers, political sociologists have done studies to find out where in the class structure these people come from, where they recruited from, are they ordinary folk, or do they tend to be well-to-do people? Well, the answer is, that if you look at the whole sweep of Canadian history, all of the prime ministers and the cabinet ministers and the provincial premiers, and you find out where they're recruited from in the class structure, you find that 40% of the most influential political figures in the history of Canada come from the top 10% of income earning families. 40% of the top political figures in Canadian history have come from the top 10% of income earning families in the country. And one might claim, plausibly I think, that if you come from a particular class, economic class, then your outlook on life, your interests, the kinds of policies that you favor, will tend to reflect the interests of the class you come from and the class you therefore represent. You may not, in other words, be able to act so easily in the interests of all Canadians because you, that's two. I'll give you two dirty looks now for talking. Excuse me, in the chartreuse. Thank you. Yeah, you. Thanks. Uh, so I'm claiming that there is a tendency for people to be recruited from the upper echelons of the society and that may bias their outlooks, the kinds of policies they favor, and so forth. And that kind of bias is reinforced by what happens at the tops of all institutions in Canadian society. We talk about elites at the top of the political system, that is the people who occupy the command posts of politics. We talk about elites in the economic system, people who control the dominant corporations in the country. There are uh, elite groups also in the military, in the academy, that is the university system, and so on. And if you look at the biographies of politicians, you find out that there exists a considerable amount of inter-elite mobility. What does inter-elite mobility mean? It means that in the course of the career of a high echelon politician, you will find that there is movement from one elite to another. Therefore, for example, former Premier of Ontario, David Peterson, is now, having retired from political life, a senior lawyer in one of the biggest and most powerful law firms in Toronto, indeed Ontario, and in fact in Canada. Many former politicians at very high levels become members of the boards of directors of dominant corporations once they retire. So there's a lot of movement, especially from the political realm to the economic realm. They're not becoming heads of trade unions, they're not becoming heads of anti-poverty organizations, 
They're becoming heads of major law firms, big philanthropic organizations, and becoming members of the boards of directors of dominant corporations. So that too suggests that there's a certain uh, alliance of outlook between wealth and political influence. And two, if you look at the biographies of people who tend to occupy dominant political positions, if you look at the biographies and lives of people who occupy any of the elite positions in Canadian society, you find other forms of, uh, other patterns of, 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 uh, of association suggesting that there's an alliance there. For example, members of different elites tend to send their kids to private schools where they become friends and get to know one another. They tend, moreover, to belong to private clubs. There's one just up here at the corner of St. George and Bloor, which you may have noticed as you go into the St. George subway. That club is an elite club that most people, the overwhelming majority of Canadians, cannot afford to join. And it is where people in high political office, people who are wealthy, get together, have a drink, have a meal, have a celebration, whatever. Uh, so there are patterns of association like the kids of the wealthy getting together in private schools, and the wealthy themselves getting together in private clubs. There's a high level of intermarriage that takes place among people in different elites. Because when you meet in school, and when you hang out together, and your parents belong to the same clubs, and you may vacation together, and so on, it is not necessarily inevitable, but it increases the probability that you're going to be marrying somebody eventually who is also in an elite position. So in other words, what we have here in the Canadian political system, and in the political system of the United States, and of all other liberal democracies, I won't even talk about other kinds of political systems where the situation is probably certainly even more extreme than it is here, but what you have is a high level of political inequality that mirrors the level of economic inequality in society. That's what I mean when I say there are persistent wealth-based inequalities of political participation and political influence in the country. So, we also see this finally in the surveys that have been conducted about Canadian political behavior and attitudes. This is just the results of one survey conducted in 2004, actually by political scientists, uh, and it shows you that, first of all, as I said earlier, there's a lot of political cynicism in Canada. Here I've divided the respondents in this representative survey of the Canadian population into three income groups. Those who make less than $30,000 a year, those who make between 30 and 70, and those who make more than 70. Now look at that top red line. What does it say? It says that all Canadians, regardless of income category, at least two-thirds of them don't say, think that government doesn't care about people like me. Even people who make $70,000 a year or more, two-thirds of them think that. When you go to people who are relatively less well-off, it's more like 70% who believe that. Right? It's even more. Who, you know, how much interest do you have in the, in the upcoming election is asked routinely on surveys conducted by political sociologists and political scientists. You see the same pattern. There's low interest in elections among about 30% of those who earn more than $70,000 a year and about 45% of those who make $30,000 a year or less. And finally, in terms of whether or not people actually voted in the last federal election. Again, you've got more people who are wealthy saying, sorry, they did vote, fewer saying they didn't, and more poor people saying that they did vote. And we know that, by the way, that the actual level of that green line is a lie. We know that actually many more people didn't vote than say they didn't vote when asked. It's after all a socially undesirable thing to say in public I didn't vote. And therefore when somebody interviews somebody else 
often there's a lot of fudging of the truth. It is not the case that 80% or 75% of Canadians voted in election at around 2004. We know that because we have the election results which tell us that the figure was actually more like 56%, right? So this is an exaggeration. But even taking that into account, what we see here is that wealthier people vote more, have more interest in elections, and think correctly that the government cares about what they, what they want. And as you move down the income ladder, people are more cynical, more apathetic. So, those are, that's the second thing I want to drive home. And the third point that I want to make, the first point that I, actually I have this in reverse order, the first point that I made that there's widespread political apathy, especially among youth. Second point that I made is that there are large, persistent, wealth-based inequalities and political influence and political participation in Canada. The third important feature of the Canadian political system that I want to emphasize to you is that there is a disconnect between the population, between the electorate, the citizenry on the one hand, and the government on the other. The citizenry is to the left of the government. The government is more right-wing than the citizenry is. Now, I know that some of you are a bit unclear on what this means. You may have heard the terms left-wing and right-wing, and you're not particularly clear on what that means, so let me explain what I mean when I say that, on average, Canadian citizens are to the left of the government. So I have here a little diagram or chart which explains what's meant by left and right. Generally speaking, when we talk about people who tend to be on the left wing of the political spectrum. It means that they have these characteristics on the left of this chart. That is to say, people on the left tend to support uh, extensive government involvement in the economy. That is, it expect, people on the left expect the government to take an active role in stimulating economic growth, perhaps in subsidizing new industries so that they can grow and so on. And people on the left also believe that there should be a strong social safety net, that is to say, an extensive program of health, education, and welfare benefits that help the less well-off people in society. They tend, moreover, to believe in uh, the, the importance of equal rights for women and racial and sexual minorities, and they believe that the environment should be protected by government regulation chiefly. The government should pass laws to protect the environment. In contrast, people on the right believe that there should be minimal government involvement in the economy. They tend to believe that the more government involvement in the economy, the less people will be inclined to work hard and be innovative, so that the rate of economic growth will slow if the government gets involved in the economy. There may be more equality if the government's involved in the economy, but uh, on average, people will be less well off, say people on the right. Moreover, people on the right tend to support a small welfare state, uh, low levels of taxation, uh, and they are tr traditionalist, or they tend to be traditionalist in their social and moral values, which means that there is, on the right, some opposition to gender equality, recognition of sexual minorities, and so on. And finally, people on the right tend to have a free market approach to the environment. They say things like the government shouldn't be involved in deciding that uh, we ought to subsidize uh, windmills and solar power and so on. That's not for the government to say, let the market decide. The market is a highly efficient mechanism and what's going to be best and most equitable and, and most productive for the society ought to be shaped by the market itself. So these are left versus right views. And on average, we know this from many, many surveys, Canadians tend to be a little bit to the left of the center of the political spectrum, Americans tend to be to a little bit to the right of the center on the political spectrum. Now, 
Where exactly do we stand? And interestingly also, where do Canada's political parties stand? I ask this question again because I'm going to make, I have made the assertion. Now I want to try to demonstrate that the electorate, the citizenry, is to the left of the government. There's a disjuncture there, a disconnect. So what I did was I went to uh, a survey conducted by political sociologists and political scientists in 2008 that asked a number of questions of people constituting a representative sample of the adult population of Canada. Among those questions were, which political party do you tend to support? Or which political party did you vote for in the last election? And another question that was asked in this survey is, to what degree do you, do you favor more social spending, that is spending on health, welfare, and education, employment insurance, and so on, to what degree do you favor more social spending supported by tax increases? Uh, and to what degree do you favor less social spending on health, welfare, and education, and tax cuts? Obviously, people who tend to favor more social, social spending and increased taxation are on the left, and those who favor the opposite are on the right. And then what I did was I looked at, for supporters of each political party, I simply subtracted the proportion supporting left-wing policies minus the proportion percentage supporting right-wing policies. That gave me a figure for each political party, right? The greater the percentage of people supporting left-wing policies minus supporting right-wing policies, the more left-wing the party is. Follow? Anybody not clear on what I just said? Okay, you're not. So I'm saying that a certain percentage of people will tend to support high taxation and increased social spending in any political party, and a certain proportion will support the opposite. That is, lower taxation and less social spending. And if you subtract the latter from the former, you get a certain percentage. And the higher that percentage, the more to the left supporters of that party are. And what we see when you do this little arithmetic exercise is that the party that's most on the left, it's got 18.2% more uh, left-wingers than right-wingers in the party. The party most on the left is the NDP. Actually, why does that say 18.2? It looks more like 28.2, doesn't it? Okay. Ignore the numbers, please. Just look at those pretty orange bars, and I'll figure out what's going on with those numbers, because there's something wrong there. What the pretty orange bars say correctly is that the NDP is most on the left, then comes the Green Party, the Liberal Party, the Bloc Québécois. But look what happens to this other political party, the Conservatives. They're below the line, which means they have more right-wingers attached to them than the left-wingers. It's just the opposite, right? So what does this mean? What this means is we have a conservative government, a majority conservative government in this country. That, oh, I know what the numbers are. That's the percentage, sorry, that the numbers on top of the bars are the percentage of Canadian voters who supported each of those parties in the 2008 election. So in other words, 37.6% of the electorate supported the Conservatives in 2008. 10% the Bloc Québécois. About a quarter supported the Liberals. 6.8% supported the Greens and 18.2% the Liberal, the uh, NDP. That's what it means. All right. The implication is this. It should be quite startling. What we have in Canada, first of all, what's the largest political party in Canada in terms of the support that attracted in 2008? Well, I guess you could say the Conservatives. I like to call it the party of non-voters. The biggest political party in Canada, and I say this I think in a somewhat cynical way, is the party of the people who didn't vote. We know that 44% of Canadians didn't vote in this election, right? So that was sort of the biggest political party, although it's not really a political party. The next biggest block of Canadian voters were Conservatives, 37.6% of them. 
And then the rest of the Canadian voters, 18.2% plus 6.8 plus 26.2 plus 10, which equals just over 61% of the voters, supported parties that are on the left. So we have a party in office, which is to the right, but over 61% of Canadians are to the left. So there's this disconnect between the party in office and the kinds of policies that it favors and the views of most Canadians. So you ask, why is there political cynicism? Well, there's political cynicism, and it's growing, because people feel that the government's not responsive, it hasn't been for many decades, that it doesn't really care about what people like me think. Young people feel that especially strongly, and people who are not wealthy feel it especially strongly. And we get governments in power that are not representative of the interests and desires and wishes of the Canadian population, so that reinforces it. <coughs> Let me move on to my next point. All of this matters because the policies, that is the laws and regulations that different political parties favor, uh, have different effects on different groups of people. So different parties tend to be supported by different groups of people. And by those by groups, I mean by different classes, by different ethnic groups, by different religious groups, and so on. There are differences by class, religion, ethnicity, region, and so on, in support that each of these parties manages to, uh, to get. Uh, and high income earners tend to support parties on the right, and low income earners tend to support parties on the left. Uh, in other words, in this country, and in most democracies, there are class-based differences in different party support, in which lower class people tend to support parties on the left, they want to see more taxes collected, because people who are poor aren't paying much in taxes, and they want to see a bigger social safety net, because they benefit from it the most, whereas wealthier people want to pay less in taxes, and they don't care so much about the social wealth, the social safety net, because they don't get anything from it. They're never going to collect employment insurance, and they can afford private health care, and so on and so forth. So you tend to see these class-based differences in support for different political parties. Um, now, the tendency for one's class position to influence one's voting, whether one votes for this party or another party, is different in different countries. That is to say, in some countries, there's a strong tendency for one's class position to influence which way one votes. And in other countries, there's a weak tendency. There's a tendency everywhere. In some places, it's stronger. In some places, it's weaker. In Canada, it is relatively weak. The tendency exists, but there's a relatively weak tendency for class to influence which party you vote for. Now, what's interesting, to me at least, is uh, what determines, what helps to shape that tendency? Why is it strong someplace and weak elsewhere? That tendency for class to influence how people vote. Well, one of the most important determinants of whether or not that tendency for people to vote according to their class interests, one of the most important factors shaping that is how socially organized or cohesive classes are. People, I'm going to argue now, tend to vote along class lines, tend to vote in favor of their class interests, tend to see their class interests clearly and vote accordingly, if they are part of a cohesive or socially organized class. And they tend not to vote according to their class interests if the class in which they are a member is not socially cohesive or not well socially organized. Moreover, I mean, just to simplify the world, let's talk about upper classes and lower classes. I know that the world is a much more complex place than that, but if we just divide the world into these two mythical classes of upper and lower, 
the ratio of 